I believe you all have your Bible there, right there in front of you. Would you open it, uh, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And while you're doing that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start reading. I'm going to be reading from verse 1. And I, Paul is speaking here. He says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Go down to verse 12 for me. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God, which things we speak, not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that's the unsaved man, receives not this, the, the things of the Spirit. And the unsaved man rejects the things of the Spirit for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15 says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who knows the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's back up to verse 15 again. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. What that is saying is the spiritual man examines, convinces, and reproves the natural man, the unsaved man of his evil ways. Yet no one is able to find fault with the, God, with the godly man. All right. Um, I am going to, the title I'm giving today's message is State of the Heart. Heart with an H, not State of the Art. I have a State of the Art computer here, and that State of the Art computer has a novice um, um, operating it. But today's message is State of the Heart. Bow your heads with me, please. Father, once again, I, I, I count it such a privilege to be able to share your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that I can absolutely rely on you to lead me as I speak these words. I pray, Lord, that you will anoint my, 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 my mouth to speak Anoint the ears of everyone who is listening now and who will um, watch this message later on YouTube or whatever source. Anoint ears, ears to hear, hearts to receive. Lord, let the truth of your word come alive in our spirits. We come against every opposing spirit that would seek to, to, to um, nullify the effects of your word. We cast these down in the name of Jesus. Father, let faith arise. Let faith arise in the hearts of your people. Let there be an anointing here this day, Father. In the name of Jesus, let hearts be changed. If we're here today and uh, you're here today and you're being buffeted by the enemy in various areas of your life, be prepared to receive. Be prepared for a change. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're getting ready even now to do in the hearts of your people. And we give everything. We give this message to you. We give the, 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 um, the whole day to you, Father. 
as we process what, what we're going to be talking about today. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Isn't it good to be part of such a large congregation? We are a, 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 a large congregation and significant congregation. You, Some of you may smile and say large. Absolutely, we are a large congregation. This is a church that that covers North America, South America, Caribbean. We are in, in, um, in Great Britain. We are on the continent of Africa. Incidentally, New World Ministries um, didn't, it, well, it, the, the, the America branch of it started four years ago, but New World Ministries has been around significantly longer. We have a, a, um, a church in, in the Congo, which is from about probably 2003 to 2004, thereabouts. So we have been around. And God has blessed us. Um, but still, many people have not heard about New World Ministries. But they will. And we will see. Remember that I told you, New World Ministries is, is, is going to be a household name. And... Um, And the Lord has been blessing us. You know, this is a church that has been carrying out the mandate that Jesus gave us in Luke 9, verse 2. It says, um, preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. We, um, we feel so blessed to be part of a church that is committed to making a difference. We feel blessed to be part of a church that is preaching the kingdom, that is healing the sick and delivering those afflicted. Not only that, this is a church that we go out of our way to empower others to do the same. This is a church that encourages everyone to, 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 to step out and be who God has called you to be. We have seen different people um, um, giving the messages um, uh, at different times. We, this is how the, uh, the early church did it. There was not just one preacher up there speaking to everybody. We have people, um, everyone is encouraged. Lord has put something in your heart to share. You have an open platform. That's how we grow in, in our own uh, ministry. We, have, we are part of a church uh, uh, that is hungry for more. We are part of a church that's striving to be all that God has called us to be. I feel especially blessed to be part of a group that trusts the Lord with all our heart. Um, sadly, not every church, when you look around you, if, whether you're here in, 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 in the U.S. or up there in Canada or wherever you are when you look, when you're, you happen to be watching this message, you look around you at the churches and you wonder, you wonder at what's, what's, what's happening there. Nothing is happening in so many churches, sadly. You know, um, I was... I was talking with Pastor Jerry <laughs> one, earlier this week, and I, I was saying, um, why are people not curious? Why are people not? You, you're, you're in a dead church. One preacher uh, called it dead preachers preaching dead sermons to dead congregations. I won't go that far, but um, I saw, I stopped at a church yesterday uh, I thought I'd share this with, with the group to kind of highlight what I'm talking about. I stopped at a church, yes, a Pentecostal church, because I wanted to see somebody there. I drove in. No one was there. There were no cars in the parking lot. I drove around, and there was no one there. And uh, so as I was coming back out, I pulled up right close to the entry door of the church had some signs there for service starting times and so on. But there was a sign on the church that says, 
please do not enter if you are not well. I could not believe what I saw. Do not come into this church if you are not well. Jesus said, I, the, 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 um, those that are well have no need for a doctor, those who are sick. He was speaking about spiritual wellness, spiritual this. But let's, it, it's, it applies in the natural too. Here's a church that clearly believes, that um, clearly does not believe in, in divine healing. Oh, I'll pray for you, but from a distance, just don't come into these, these, these holes. How sad is that? How, how, how pathetic is that? Um, you wonder at people sitting in churches year after year and not get a little jealous. You know, we see, we watch TV, we see preachers out there laying hands on people, we see things happening, but we're not seeing that in our church. Of course, you all know I'm not talking about this church. And, and, and they're, not, they're not curious. They're not hungry. Um, they sit in churches where pastors make a ministry of mocking other pastors. If you go on YouTube anytime, I get, I get, I get so sickened when I see this. Pastors out there making fun of pastors who are walking in the in the anointing, whose churches are you're seeing the manifestation of kingdom power. Yeah, they try to tear them down. Some of the headings um, uh, exposing false preachers. You know who is one of the false preachers? I couldn't believe it. Kenneth E. Hagen according to these people. A man whose ministry was so powerful the world over, but these pastors who have no faith, no faith that God will perform what he says he will, no faith in the, in the word, and they, they, they have nothing to say and a whole hour to say it, so they use that hour to try to tear down pastors who are moving in the anointing there is one in particular this is a, uh, that i think is is the saddest of them all he's he's in a wheelchair he looks to be in not only a paraplegic he looks like he's a quadriplegic he can barely move his hands that's about all that can move he's in a wheelchair and uh, a, a, an educated man from how he speaks but he has he has no faith for his own healing, but he's tearing down pastors out there who are moving in that healing anointing. You wonder, does he not, does he not believe that healing belongs to us? Um, they ridicule the word of faith. How can you ridicule a word of faith? There's a word of faith. You to speak it according to the word. Are you speaking it in faith? And you expect God to do his part. They ridic they ridi absolutely ridicule that. And, uh, and they call the pastors by name. <laughs> Evidently, they do not believe that healing belongs to them. That healing, if you're a believer, healing belongs to you. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid the price for salvation for our souls, which let me hasten to add, is infinitely better than healing for the body. Salvation for this, what Jesus did at the cross, paved the way for our salvation. And that there is no greater gift that a human being can receive than salvation for the soul. But at the same time, Jesus also made provisions for healing of our body. <clears throat> um, I 
excuse me. So the let me um let me read three scriptures <laughs> that prove this that healing belongs to us. Because Jesus took the healing on himself, and that is in that is a clear indication that we should not be carrying sickness in our bodies. We believe we have faith for our healing. We say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. I believe that you took my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. Uh, I, uh, um, I want to make you Lord of my life. And we, we, we say we're born again. And we have faith for that. But the, for healing and deliverance and all of that stuff, we, that's where we waver. But healing, deliverance, and all of that belong to us. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The Lord took Isaiah. He showed him what was going to happen in the future. He took him, so Isaiah was, was watching this in real time. So he says here, yeah, and by his stripes we are healed. This was uh, repeated in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, that it might be for, uh, um, fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. When Peter wrote this, the, 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 what Jesus did was already in the rear view mirror. It was already fait accompli. It was done. So Peter said, who his own self bore our sickness in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. In Peter's time, in, in Isaiah's time, God brought him to forward to, to to see it in real time in peter's time it was already done so by his stripes you were healed now if you were healed that means you are healed and that healing was provided for us two thousand years ago so does healing belong to us it's an emphatic yes Jesus paid the price. Jesus pay, made provisions for our healing. There's no question about that. He came, John 10, verse 10, that we might have life. Not just life, but abundant life. It is necessary that we have abundant life, that we can do the work that he has set before us. You know, Jesus said, go ye into all the world. Mark 16, verse 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is his mandate to us. We can, we can hardly fulfill that if our body is, is hobbled by sickness and disease and, uh, of every nature. Um, Satan does not want us to do, to carry out that mandate. When Jesus says, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, you know what Satan says? I'm going to mess you. I'm going to mess with your mind. I'm going to put thoughts in there. So you're going to doubt if that word means you. I'm going to uh, uh, make you doubt that, um, that, that, that uh, um, I'm going to put false belief, fear, fear of going out there, what, how people will react to you, how people will respond to you. Uh, Satan does not want you to do, to carry out that, that mission. He says, I'm going to mess with your body. I'm going to afflict you physically. 
there are so many people that that pastor that I just mentioned, he does, he clearly has his mind messed up by the devil. He does not believe that healing belongs to him. He does not believe in the power, Holy Spirit power to take him out of that wheelchair. He doesn't believe because the mind is all messed up. Satan wants to rob you of the abundant life that will make you, give you the ability to minister effectively. Salvation belongs to you. Healing belongs to you. Irrespective of what the enemy wants to, to place in your heart. Satan is a liar and a thief. Let's bear that in mind. Jesus made provisions for salvation. Let me repeat it again. Is everybody saved? No. If not, why not? There are conditions. He made provisions for our salvation, but we have to appropriate that, and we do that through faith in the word of God. We do that irrespective of what the devil wants to try to plan, plan that we allow him to plant in our, in our thoughts. Salvation belongs to us. Healing belongs to us. Is everybody healed? No. Like salvation, there, 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 there is a condition. You have to appropriate that healing through faith. If you are a believer, Sickness has no place in your body, should have no place in your body. If you're a believer, you have authority over every weapon of the enemy. Sickness is one, diseases, whatever he throws your way. If you're a believer and you know who you, the, the word and you know who you are. So let us, so where is our faith? Is that what's tripping us up? Faith, in the area of faith, we, we get messed up all the time. Um, let us look, go to the scripture and look at a few um, um, instances of people operating in faith and take a, a, a page from their book. Um, turn with me to the, the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read this one. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Let me read that for you. And they, they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should, he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal. The more they told him to, to shut up, the more he cried out. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise. He calls you. He's calling you. Verse 50, and he, Bartimaeus, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. I'm going to come back to this verse for a special reason. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what, will you that, what, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go your way. Your faith has made, uh, has made you whole. And immediately... He received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Let us back up to verse 50. And he, Bartimaeus, when he heard that Jesus called him, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. We may read that and, and not understanding the, the culture of the day. We, it's just, uh, just words. We, we may not understand the significance. But what he did there was a show of faith that Jesus saw. And, and, and rewarded. You see, casting away the garment, as a beggar, that garment identified him as a beggar. So people, he was blind, 
people would be passing. He will see who's passing much of the time, but they see that garment that was his license to beg. And that was the, his identification card for people to give him money. But when he, he heard that the Lord called him, he threw away his license to beg. He said, I'm not going to need this anymore. And Jesus rewarded that faith. Another faith, uh, um, um, uh, you see, um, Bartimaeus, his heart was in the right state. Let's uh, talk about one other. We can't talk about faith without mentioning that woman with the, the issue of blood. She said, if I could just, we've heard this a million times, if I could just touch his garment. And, and she did. And she received. The, her faith, her faith um, caused the, 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 the power to flow, the healing power to flow into her body. And she was healed. Her faith. Because her heart was in the right state. We read in the scripture in Matthew chapter 15 about the Syrophoenician woman. Her daughter was, was oppressed by, by demons and she came to Jesus. We all know this story. He called out to him and he ignored her for a while, but she kept on and then finally answered her and told her, it's not right that, that we should take the children's bread and give it to dogs. We, many of us, weak in faith, would probably be insulted by that. But she, she did not react that way at all. And she said, yes, Lord, but, you know, I'd be classified as a dog, yes. But even the dogs, um, even the dogs eat the crumbs. He said, Lord Jesus, I don't, I, I don't want you to give me the whole loaf of bread or even a slice for that matter. I just want the crumbs from that table. What did Jesus say to her? I'm going to read it here. He says, woman, oh woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you even as you will. And her daughter was made well from that very hour. You know, God doesn't want to give us, he certainly doesn't want to give us crumbs under the table. He doesn't want to give us a slice of that bread at all. He doesn't even want to give us that loaf of bread. He wants to give us the whole bakery. But too often, too often we settle for crumbs because of our lack of faith. That woman settled for crumbs because of her faith. Her heart was in the right state. How about you? How about you? I know I'm not talking to specifically to the people on this call right now, but this message is going to be seen on, on, on YouTube and other channels. And there are people in various stages of their Christian walk. How about your faith? How about you? Is Satan making inroads? And, and of course, I'm speaking to everybody, right? Because sometimes we slip up. Is Satan making inroads in your life? Is Satan attacking your marriage? Your finances? Are you allowing him to, to attack your health? Your children? Your quality of life? Are you undergoing demonic oppression in any area of your life? Generational curses? Are you afflicted with any kind of addiction? Drug addiction, alcohol, food addiction, pornography, you name it. Is that a problem in your life? You have authority over demons to cast them out. 
You have power to heal the sick. You have power to cure diseases. There are scriptures that, that, that support this. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Let me, see, let me, um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. I'm just going to give you those scriptures real, real fast. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his disciples, his 12, unto him, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. The same power he gave his disciples. Let's remember, that's his early church. He started the, 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 this church. So the same power and authority he gave to the disciples is for us as well. Verse 8 says, uh, he said them, he says, heal the sick. Here are the things that we can do. If we believe the word, if we accept the word, if we receive the word, heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Mark 16. Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's you and me. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 reads... Bear with me. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority. Where we see disciples, let's, let's, put our, let's put us there. Because that was us. He called uh, and, and, and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. John chapter 14, verse 12 says, He that believes in me, Jesus is speaking here. He that believes in me, the works I do shall he do, and greater works shall he do, because I go to my Father. Go to the first epistle of John, of John chapter 4. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. John, 1 John 4, verse 17, I'm reading these just to sort of reinforce in our minds, in our hearts, who we are, what we have. So let me ask you this. Where is your heart in all of this? Um, I'm going to talk a little uh, to kind of put some of this into perspective. I'm going to talk about my, my own walk. Um, I, as far back as I can remember, even as a child going to church, it was an ordeal. I found out later that, um, you know, the, the, everything was so boring. There was nothing to stimulate the mind. It's the same message week after week, and you're, you're nodding off. And you pop a candy in your mouth and you get a little sugar, whatever you get from the sugar to, 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 to wake you up momentarily. But how much candy can you, can you afford? 
Well, as a kid, you have, you have you don't have much money to stop a shop and buy candy, unless you're going to be uh, use your your collection and your uh, your mother would kill you. But then you knew some in, in your heart that you better not touch that thing. That's God. I knew at least that as a child. But the um the the the, the monotony that 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 droning that monotonous drone on and on. And all of the services seem to end the same way, on the same note. You're there fast as and then you hear the words, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into but he that could do it, the will of God. When you hear those words, oh, it's end. So you're going to play the, 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 the final hit. Um, amazing, oddly, you're so asleep the whole time. When you hear those words, you're wide awake now because in anticipation that you're going home. It's, 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 as I got older and started to understand a little better, I realized I was, I was enduring church instead of enjoying church. It's not supposed to be that way. If we're ministering to adults, children, we have to do it in a way that, that everyone is, is, is blessed. Um, I, as I grew older, as, as I, uh, I started searching, searching for churches, because I'm, I'm not easily, I don't settle, I can't settle when it comes to this, I want to grow. I, there was always that hunger. Um, and then I found, when I came to Georgia 25 years ago, I found a church and I said to myself, I have arrived. The, the worship was so wonderful. The, um, the preaching was, was on point. It still is. Great church. Great worship. Great preaching. We even prayed for the sick there. We prayed and prayed. Uh, and, and we had some, some nice sounding prayers too, you know. But there's no real evidence that a lot of people got healed but who was noticing it it was a great we were having real church for the first time and um, then a wake-up call was when i watched a man of god that i had gotten to know to get quite close to i watched him be waste away and die, waste away from cancer and die. We were both on the um, deacon's board and he, when he got cancer, we had gone through Tres Dias together, a, a weekend retreat up in Georgia mountains. That's when I met him first time and he told me his story and, and um, uh, how he had come from a family of, of, of racists and um, and all kinds of things. Anyway, won't go into that now in the interest of time, but we became good friends. And then cancer hit him. And we're all praying for him. We're in the deacon's board. We, 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 we lay hands on him. That poor man, if you checked him, he probably had indentations in his back from those fingers that they week after week. And one would pray and another would pray. The same prayer, but we're all sounding good. And, uh, but we're praying in faith. And he died. I went to his funeral. The, his death shook me. His death bothered me. It, it, it shook my faith. My faith took a hammering. I couldn't understand. Lord, we prayed in faith. How is it that you didn't um, honor that? It bothered me intensely. And his was the first of, of four um, that he was, no, no, he was the third of four that would die and, and um, uh, even after our many prayers. The first one, he was such a, he was such a, he had such a sweet spirit. And the people I'm talking about, Carolyn knows all of them, but I won't call their name. We went to the same church. This man had such a, uh, he was so, so gentle, so, such a gentle soul. And we watch him um, 
Uh, he took me to, to Tres Dias when I went through that three-day um, thing. He picked me up at my home here, took me to the, where we left, uh, took the bus to go up there. Then the Sunday evening, he came and picked me up there, up in Georgia Mountains, brought me home. When he came to pick me up, he was he was having problems with one of his arms. He was saying it, it, it can he had trouble difficulties using that arm i offered to drive but he said no he managed so we came down and um turned out what he was suffering from in retrospect it was what we call als amyotrophic lateral sclerosis here in, in america or canada it's lou gehrig's disease and we saw his motor functions, his, his voluntary muscles go, then the involuntary muscles, and then he wasted away. I went to his funeral. We prayed a lot for him. I was not a deacon then, so um, I guess I didn't understand as much. There was another, an older man. He had a recurrence of cancer, and this time it took him out. I went to his funeral too. The last one was an older man, a wonderful man, a very good friend. And um, he loved my son. And um, he had heart disease. And I ministered to that man and um, in, in the best I could. And um, I was one of his pallbearers. See, we we prayed. We prayed and we prayed often and we prayed well. But we lacked knowledge of who we are, what we have, what we can do. We prayed, God, heal this man. We begged, we pleaded with the Lord to heal this person, heal that. Please heal God. We don't want so-and-so to die. I could almost hear God saying, I don't want him to die either. Why don't you do what you're supposed to do? We prayed when we should have been taking authority. It is not God's job to minister healing to the sick, to minister deliverance to the afflicted. It is our job. And the sooner we know it and, and understand it and walk in that reality, the better all of us will be. Paul had no more Holy Spirit than any of us did. The difference is that Paul understood who he was. He understood what he had and what he could do. That's why Paul said what he said. And we couldn't, we, we couldn't say it. Paul said, and my speech and my preaching was not in enticing words. Our, our, our prayers were very enticing words, nice sounding words. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That's where we, 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 we messed up. That's where we missed it. There was no demonstration of kingdom power in our praying. I want to say this now. Enter the guest preacher. I was at the, um, the weekend retreat, we call it Tres Dias, up in Georgia Mountains. And um, the pastor of the church was there with me. And um, we had a guest preacher preaching. Now at my church, as, uh, as Carolyn, Carolyn can uh, attest, by 12 o'clock, everybody is drifting home and so on. Minutes to four that day, my wife called me. She said, three o'clock, hardly anybody wanted to leave. People were being healed of all kinds of things. So when that guest preacher came, the, about three or so weeks later, I said, I have, to, I have to hear this man. 
So I was there and I was impressed. That's a Sunday, that, that's a, the day when I was healed of migraine headache. I was impressed with what I saw and what I heard. There were words of knowledge. There were healings, all kinds of healings. And this man, he spoke with authority and not as normal, regular pastors. That was the, the this day when I met Pastor Jerry. He was the guest preacher. And we have been fast friends ever since I could not let him go. You know, <laughs> thank you, Anne. He introduced to me, as a matter of fact, he, he earned the right that Sunday when I was there. He earned the right. He didn't say it, but he earned the right to say, as Paul did, and my speech and my preaching was not a, 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 a enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the, in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. He, he had the authority to say that, even if he didn't. He introduced me to a book, the first of many, written by Kenneth Hagen, Bible Prayer Study Course. A book that changed my, changed my life. It changed my, my prayer ministry. It it was, it's, that book is a must for every serious believer. And that study, the Bible study on prayer, is then when we're finished with the current study we're doing on the Holy Spirit, we're going to do that study. Because that is a book that we, we, we must have. Um, I feel that I owe it to Pastor Jerry for turning me on to Kenneth E. Hagen. I feel that I owe it to Kenneth Hagen for teaching me how to pray in line with biblical principles. It changed my prayer life completely. And I started to see results. We pray for people and now we're seeing changes, we're seeing differences, we're seeing results. And you know, even with that, there were some that did not get healed. And that bothered me uh, for a while. Until I met another man of God in South Georgia, Thomaston, South Georgia, Dr. Henry Wright, with a last name like that, you can't be wrong. And <laughs> I believe I owe it to Dr. Henry Wright for opening my eyes to the spiritual root um, of sicknesses and how to if uh, and how to effectively deal with them. And um, and that took me to another level. See, not all sicknesses have a spiritual root. Some do. Not all cancers have a spiritual root. Some do. But I, I, I studied at his, that man's feet for a little, and, I, and I, I was like a sponge absorbing all that he taught because it made sense, and he lined it up with the word of God, and that made a huge change in my life. So in my own personal ministry, I have lost, I have la lost track. I've lost track of the, 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 the many people that I've seen healed and delivered of all kinds of afflictions. I've lost track. And uh, I've seen sport injury, deaf ears, people healed of cancer. People receiving new heart, lupus going into remission, you name it. And then one day, um, it was back in 2012, July, 
I went to my, my personal physician to do my annual. Um, it's not a real truth to say it was annual because the last time that I'd gone was about three years prior. And, uh, but he had given me a referral because um, my, my PSA reading that has to do with the prostate um, was high. So he gave me a referral, which I had, <laughs> didn't take as seriously as I probably should have. So when I went back to him July 2012 and he did my stuff, we checked everything, then he said to me, your PSA reading is high. What did the oncologist say? I said, what did the uncle who just? Um, I, <laughs> so he said, didn't you? I said, no, I didn't go. So he gave me another referral. He said, you must go. All right, it sounded serious enough, so I went. And the oncologist, when he saw the reading, he, he, he was not happy with it at all. And he wanted to make sure that it is, it is, it is not incorrect. So he did his own. He, I hate those needles. So he put pull blood to do a test and um, called me a few days later. I have to come in. I, he prepped me for a, a, a prostate biopsy. What a, what a horrible um, procedure. It, it's so invasive, so uh, it, anyway. And a week later, I got a call from the doctor's office. And um, he, can he, I was at another part of town. Um, he, can you have a moment to talk? I, I realized that something from the tone, that something was kind of serious. So I pulled over to the strip mall and he started talking to me. And um, I could tell that he was letting me down easily, telling me uh, this, then you know that. And then bottom line, you have prostate cancer. It's one thing to pray for others, pray and believe for others and pray in faith. And, and, and But when the person who needs that, that healing is you, amazing how the dynamics shift in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat, in that fraction of a, a minute, of a second probably, I saw so many things. I saw my, 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 my casket. I saw family dressed in black. I saw all, I, I saw myself not being able to walk my daughter down the aisle uh, on her big day. I so many things I saw in that fleeting moment of time. You know, when you get a, a terminal report, the natural mind goes straight to the grave. And that's where mine went. And um, he kept talking and it's, I was in a different world now. I'm hearing the sounds. You know, you've just been diagnosed with the number two killer of men in the United States. You heard a report that something that happens to other people is happening to you now. You're going to die. Other people die. You don't die. So it, it so he kept talking, and it's as if I was in. I can't explain the, the the kind of chamber that I was in, but I heard his voice. It's like, it's, and I'm hearing the word he's saying. But and then at the end, he said, um, "I'm so sorry to be giving you this kind of news." And then we hung up, and I sat there stunned. And then from somewhere inside, I had an urge to laugh. Now, how can that's the most ridiculous thing that you could have had at a, a time like that, to laugh. So I, I followed the urge and I laughed out loud. Whenever I tell this story, I, all, I always add that, you know, see, and because it's happened, in, if secretly I thank God for cell phones. Because when people see you alone in your car, you're talking and laughing. They don't think anymore that you're mad. They think they assume that you're on the phone. So <laughs> I laughed out loud. And then I said, good try, Satan. These were my exact words. Good try, Satan. Um, but let me remind you who I am. I am a son of the one true living God. Cancer has no place in my body. 
in the name of Jesus, I reject that report. In the name of Jesus, I cancel that diagnosis. And then I started driving home. I am still, my head is, is, is light. My, I'm still in a different world driving home. I'm, I'm trying to sing his praises. I'm driving home. But the, the scripture that kept coming to me was from the book of James. Well, let him ask in, in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a waver. Let, let that man not expect to receive anything from God. That was a scripture that was coming to me. I can't afford to waver. So I'm coming home and I'm saying, you know, I, my wife is half of me. If I tell her, she may, she may waver a little. She may want me to go, you know, go to the doctor, do this. Maybe uh, women love to go to doctors. I don't know what's wrong with them. Um, but I, 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 said, <laughs> I said, I'm not going to, I, I determined in my I can't tell my wife, this the stakes are too high. And I, I can't absolutely vouch for her not uh, having some little doubts and misgivings. So I came home and uh, I reached out to the one person I could think of, my spiritual mentor and friend and my prayer partner. Pastor Jerry, he was in Toronto, and together we, 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 we broadsided Satan, and we took care of that on the phone, and we had, um, I still didn't tell my wife, and one day, probably about a week after that, she said to me, um, um, because she knew I did some tests, she said, oh, what was the result of that test? Luckily, my back was to her, so I um, I said, everything came up negative. I didn't, well, she wasn't seeing my face, so she couldn't read anything in there, but and I didn't really lie because it, it, it came positive, but I, I declared it negative. So for all practical purposes, I, I it was negative. But three weeks after the, the, um, the diagnosis, I had to be going into the hospital to do a CAT scan. I had to be at the hospital at 7 a.m. No way am I going to be able to pull that off without my wife knowing something is up. So after church that Sunday, I told her that I have, I was, I've been keeping something from you. And she was not happy. She said she knew. And, she was, and then I told her she was not happy that I could keep something as important from her. Um, but... It is what it is. Um, so I had my options now. I did the CAT scan and they showed that it not, had not gone to other areas of my body. So I have three uh, options. One is surgery. The surgery is going to um, leave you um, um, incontinent. They don't, I can't tell you for how long. Or you can do chemo and radiation. None of those options appeal to me. So I thanked them and I went my way. And I kept going to church. I did not say a word to, I was on the deacon's board that I didn't say a word to anyone. Because I've seen how they, we, we prayed there for people. I've been to too many funerals there for people we prayed for. So I kept it myself. I just went, worship my God. I'm smiling as I always do. And everything was fine. And um, uh, a year later, not, not quite a year, 10 months later, May of 2013, I went back for my physical. My blood pressure was normal. They had given me, put me on blood pressure medication, which I took for probably a month or so before I threw them away. My cholesterol was normal. My PSA, normal. I have never done surgery, never taken chemo, never go, undergone radiation. It's now 11 years. I am on no kind of prescription medication. And I am hale and hearty. And I give all praise to the Lord. I give him all the praise and all the glory because he's faithful to his word. We are, you know, we are all able ministers, every one of us. We have the mission in life, a mission given to us by Jesus to preach. Um, 
to, to, to preach the kingdom of God, win lost souls. That's what we're here for, to spread the word, spread the good news. Heal the sick and afflicted, set the captives free. That's our job. Do we love him enough? Do we love him enough to do what he needs us to do? He needs us to, to walk in that road. He's not going to come down here himself and, and minister. Do we love him enough to do, to do that? Do we love our fellow man enough to do what, everything in our power to rescue him from the snares of hell? Do we? Let me ask you this. Finally, in closing, what exactly is the state of your heart? Let me suggest this. Each of us, each of us ask ourselves this question right now. What exactly is the state of my heart? Bow your heads, please. Father. I thank you. I thank you for helping me to present this message today. Lord, I, I pray that, that uh, uh, even one heart has been touched. Lord, I pray that we will make a commitment in ourselves to look deeper into ourselves and, and, and see just exactly who we are we're tired of being buffeted by the enemy lord i pray that this message will serve to remind us of exactly who we are exactly what we have in you and exactly what we can do father i give you all the praise and all the glory in jesus name amen